way. All right. So good afternoon. I am so happy to be here. I'd like to speak with you today about two extremes of the motherhood experience and how one led me to another. The first extreme is what I call society's bias against the non-maternal. The second is what I call reverse mothering. By society's bias, I mean the widespread hostility towards childless women, which became for a time a part of my artistic practice, as can be seen here in an exhibit in my, of my work in Wyoming and this installation in New York City. Though rarely remarked upon, childless or child-free women are disparaged in cultures around the world. Non-maternity, whether chosen by circumstance or chosen, is nowhere near considered normative, leaving childless women to face a broad spectrum of disdain. Although often attributed to Yoko, it was actually John Lennon who famously sang, women are the niggers of the, mater of the world. And I'd like to amend this refrain by adding that childless women are the niggers of maternalism, a dominant attitude even within some feminist circles. Cultures far and near, including our Western one, resent even demonized women without children. The non-maternal body, the barren, fertile, don't want to have a kid, can't have a kid woman is perceived to be a threat to mothers, motherhood, and maternity. Nun-hearted and blind to the world, wrote Sylvia Plath, the poet. As a result, childless women are disrespected, shunned, and in some societies, discriminated against. In extreme cases, they are driven to suicide. Here are some examples of how societies view childless women. A woman without children is like a tree without leaves. That's a proverb from Chad. A woman from Cameroon wrote of her in-laws, they started to call me a barren woman, a witch. My mother-in-law said I was a man in a woman's body. Another woman from Uganda said, my husband threatened to divorce me, his family telling me I was eating their son's food for nothing. American, oops, an American scholar, Carolyn Morell, observed that women who do not become mothers are aberrant at best and tragic at worst. 32-year-old Shilpka Shivan Kundakar in Kawar, India, distressed over her inability to conceive after 10 years of marriage, hanged herself from the ceiling of her home. The author and poet Adrian Rich wrote in her classic book of women born that the childless woman throughout recorded history has been regarded as a failed woman, unable to speak for the rest of her sex. Childless women, she continued, have been burned as witches, persecuted as lesbians, and refused the right to adopt children because they were unmarried. They have been seen as the great threat to male hegemony, the woman who is not tied to family, who is disloyal to the loyal of heterosexual pairing and bearing. In Britain, where I just came from, there are women like the columnist Karen Sarler, who wrote in The Guardian that much as I like to trumpet the importance of a woman's right to choose all things at all times, there's one choice I can't simply understand, and that is the choice of an otherwise sane woman not to have children. My first reaction on reading this was disbelief, especially because I'd been mulling over this issue in my own mind. I felt flooded with questions. Are childless women actively discriminated against? Who takes up the slack for working women when they take maternity leave? Are there tax penalties against childless couples? Then I realized that in the United States, where I think most would recoil at the idea of shunning childless women, a large part of the population has spent years attempting to actually outlaw one type of childlessness, and I'm speaking, of course, about abortion. And actually, the same crowd's going after birth control, but that's a whole other conversation. And the relentless effort to make this form of childless unavailable and a crime. Members of the anti-abortion culture have murdered doctors. They've firebombed clinics. 
They've deceived pregnant women and imposed punitive, phony requirements on doctors and health clinics that still provide legal abortions. We have many ways to categorize the struggle, but whatever it may be, it is certainly a chapter in the long, sad history of hostility towards childless women and the brutal means by which some seek to impose their concept of motherhood on everyone else. Realizing this, I wondered whether domestic terrorism had become a price of deciding not to have a child. The tyranny of maternity is sometimes called pernatalism, and it's almost as controversial today as when Shulamith Firestone discussed it in the 1970s, The Dialectic of Sex. Women will not be fully emancipated, she wrote, until they are free from the demands of biology. Yeah. Firestone saw, Firestone saw emancipation's tools in concepts like artificial insemination and surrogate motherhood that, back then, were little better than science fiction. Today, these and other alternative maternities are widespread. Yet, rather than emancipate women by releasing them from maternity's grip, they have added new pressures to women in the great pursuit of biological childbearing, often a pursuit undertaken at great cost in terms of finances and health. My second response to um, Carol Sarler's writing was artistic. The article represented an attitude that I felt needed a response. I began by embroidering negative comments such as Sarler's onto baby clothing, giving shape, as it were, to a free-floating unease. I began with seven dresses, which were included in an online exhibition at nanomajority.com, and they received a lot of attention. Then at the urging of Melissa Potter, my friend and colleague at Columbia College Chicago, I submitted them to MAMA, Motherhood Around the Globe, an online exhibition that was organized by the International Museum of Women. I felt very insecure about submitting this work, but it was accepted, and again, to my surprise, it it gained a great deal of attention. Continuing the project, which I call Baby Not On Board, I added rompers so the work would not be so gendered. And to date, I've embroidered 18 garments in all. Some of them read, women don't want to run startups because they'd rather have children. Your artwork is the best, your child is the best artwork you ever made. You don't need to make any other art. You are not a real parent if you only have one child. And from Carolyn Sarler, childless women lack an essential humanity. Next, I put the garments onto hyper-realistic dolls and created a photographic portfolio I called the presence of their absence, in which the infants seemed to criticize their own existence. I continued to work on photo shoots like this, and then I began to include myself. I started in the safety of the studios at Columbia College Chicago, then I moved to a park behind South Loop Elementary School, to the playground, and then we went to Chicago's Michigan Avenue inside the American Girl store, which is known for its large, realistic dolls. I designed a print-on-demand artist book and to combine these and other photographs with the research that I've made about the disparagement of childless women both across cultures and historically, as this is not a new phenomenon. And I have the book over on the table. I also brought a copy for Deidre, so it's over on the book table. I soon became interested in a related issue, which is the way women become separated from and discredited about their other accomplishments as soon as they become pregnant. Often, pregnant women find it impossible or difficult even to keep working, as we just had a whole example of, um, unless they are in senior positions or relatively wealthy, like Facebook Chief Officer Cheryl Sandberg, the author of Lean In. This is partly circumstantial, as childbearing takes time, energy, money, and decent support systems, but it is also attitudinal. In many people's eyes, impending motherhood simply trumps everything else. I began to think not only what it means to be a mother, which I am not, but what it means to have a mother. And my relationship with my mother, Ida, my own then 89-year-old mother, here seen in earlier days, I showed Ida some of the photographs from the presence of their absence, and she responded strongly to the dolls. 
So I got her one, one of the realistic ones. Ida, who was beginning to show signs of dementia, was captivated and overjoyed. She had been a maternity nurse and acted as if the doll, which she named Tabitha, were a real infant. I shot another series of photographs of Ida, Tabitha, myself with both of them. I housed them in a limited edition portfolio fitted with a keyhole-shaped opening mechanism, which the viewers need to pry open to access the prints. And I call this portfolio series The Key is in the Window, borrowing a phrase from Kaddish, Allen Ginsberg's epic poem about, his, about Naomi, his mad dying mother. Kaddish is a Hebrew word that means holy and is also a daily prayer in Jewish religious services. It is best known as a prayer for the dead, though it doesn't mention death or even refer to loss. In my photographs, I'm trying to address a near-universal conundrum that I've come to think of as reverse mothering, by which I mean the relationships many of us are entering as our parents live beyond the point where they can take care of themselves and, like small children, must be cared for by us, their own children, now adults. In the U.S., nearly a third of all families are coping with the needs of very elderly parents. And more will do so as the country's post-World War II baby boom ages. At the same time, today's elderly are living longer. Those over 90, for example, comprise the largest growing demographic group in the U.S. Diseases that once killed us slow, quickly now kill slowly. Multiple illnesses inhabit our bodies that would have earlier only tolerated one, maybe two. Alzheimer's disease and other dementias persist for years. While the modern healthcare system enables the aging to live longer, it also more frequently demands that their grown children manage medical crises and care as if the elderly had retur- reverted to a final, incapacitating childhood. We can only surmage surmise how many grown children, usually a family's females, are finding themselves involved in such necessary role reversals which, even though compelled by circumstance, are difficult and distressing. Caring for Ida before she passed away this last past year led me to consider what it means to be a mother and what it means to have a mother while exploring my own relationship with her as she faded before my eyes. I saw the key is in the window in this light as an effort to represent the complicated mother-child bonds that cannot be easily decoded. I've been working on a series of about three by four foot works called Transformations based on cut and manipulated photo collages of Ida set into large picture frames. I also use small versions of the collages in an installation where the collages rest atop a dresser whose drawers hold items recalling Ida's presence. This piece called Whole was done last summer in Berlin. The white dresser seemed really appropriate at the time because my mom was still alive, but she passed this past December. And I feel so grateful that I was able to revisit this installation at the Alternative Maternals exhibition that was a part of the conference in Berlin. Now the dresser is smaller and it's wood which emulates the plain wood casket that is the tradition for burial in Jewish culture. I'd like to leave on a final piece that I, a project, an ongoing project I call What's Your Baby? In which I want to change the question, not do you have children or don't you have children, but what's your baby? I've heard so many people say, oh, the car was his baby, the garden was her baby, the house was his baby. This bookstore is obviously somebody's baby. Um, So I was given the opportunity with a very funny little hallway space at Columbia College Chicago called the Fountains Foundation 916, where I installed the garments onto the arms with mirrors where the heads would be. And in this Um, And so I asked people to tell me what their babies were, and then I started a Tumblr blog. So I invite you all, I have cards I'll leave here, to take the card, go to the Tumblr blog, and tell me what your baby is, so that everyone can have a baby, at least metaphorically. Thank you so much. (laughs) 